format over the years. Another quite radical change in television, this one technical, is on the way, and it's to do with the quality of the picture and the shape of the screen. Because of the restrictions of existing technology, it's difficult to demonstrate what's going to happen. But if you'd be so good as to turn your head on one side for the next minute, we can show you how the shape of the screen affects the images televised. Those pictures were shot with a camera on its side. By reversing the traditional aspect ratio of four along and three up, the camera was able to frame tall upright shapes which normally don't fit our 4-3 screen. If you think that a rather extreme demonstration, then take a look at this. Yeah, I know you got up in the world once you got rid of that girl. Or did she get rid of you? Wouldn't understand. Motivation, that's what you need. That's what the new film, Absolute Beginners, will look like when it's eventually screened on TV. Splendid, you might say, but hardly what the director intended. In fact, the film was shot on Cinemascope, an ultra-wide format that won't fit into a normal TV screen. Take a look again. Yeah, I know you got up in the world once you got rid of that girl. Or did she get rid of you? Everything outside that white box has been discarded. An editor, helped by this box of tricks called Cinetrace, has had to select each frame to be shown on your screen. Self-motivation. She's jailbait. And you're the one who'll end up inside. Imagine me in a court. Who's gonna believe a baby face like me to be in this racket? If you could see yourself now, you'd realize you don't look young at all. You just look old. Old and used. Film directors will be relieved to learn that a wider screen, combined with a much sharper picture, are part of an international race towards what's called high-definition television. Next month at Dubrovnik, the regulatory body, the CCIR, will meet to decide whether there should be a single world production standard for high-definition TV. The Japanese and Americans want their high-definition system accepted now, but most Europeans are more cautious and are loosely behind a satellite transmission standard called MAC. Both aim to provide wider and better pictures by satellite, but they've set about it in very different ways. The more revolutionary of the two is the Japanese, which can produce programs with nearly double the number of lines on existing sets. Their high-definition system can't transmit by satellite yet, and there are no sets to receive it. But when they run their videotape, the effect is stunning. You'll just have to take my word for it. One way it's revolutionary is because the aspect ratio is now five by three. That means five units in width and three units in height. This is very much the same as a standard cinema, and it was derived from very many tests with members of the public. The picture contains around four to five times more picture information than a conventional television picture. And the, the uh, system also has a faster frame rate. That means that the rate of pictures per second is 30 pictures per second. This gives you much better motion portrayal, especially on fast motion. You seem to have cracked the production problems with this system, but how are you actually going to deliver the picture by satellite? Initially, we actually think that we will deliver the picture by, by either a cassette, somewhat similar to your video home cassette, like a VHS or Beta, maybe by video disc in the same sort of time, and then eventually we have two possibilities for satellite. We have a, a system called Muse, which is quite complicated, which, act which actually um, enables you to transmit over a standard satellite channel high-definition pictures. Then in the future, we imagine in 10 years, satellites will be able to take high-definition signals directly without any special uh, systems. Will broadcasters have to throw away all their equipment and viewers buy new sets with this system? 
Broadcasters already um, re-equip their studios every five to eight years, which means they totally re-equip. So the answer is yes, but this already happens. So it's a matter of the broadcasters actually scheduling their replacement program. Rather similarly, in the home, majority of people change their television sets every three to five years. So um, it's not such a big problem. If you know it's coming, you can make provision. The Japanese and Americans have been lobbying all around the world for their system and argue it is vital to avoid the incompatible television standards of the past. But most of Europe would prefer an evolutionary approach. At the IBA, engineers here have been working on a satellite transmission system known as Enhanced Mag. It'll provide much improved pictures on existing 625 line sets and wider pictures when completely new sets are developed. It will offer the viewer the chance of having new broadcasting services, but in an evolutionary way. We're basing all of our research on the fact that this, any new broadcasting service, such as a direct one from satellites, will start with people wanting to watch the pictures on existing televisions. And therefore, we have tailored the transmission system we've been working on to deliver the signal to existing sets, but in such a way that when newer and better designs come, we can offer an improved concepts to the signal, like wider and bigger pictures. What particular picture problems were you trying to solve? We recognize that the existing color television system we use in the United Kingdom, good as it is, does have certain inherent disadvantages built into it. The well-known check jacket effect when it bursts into, into a very colored pattern, quite unnaturally, is one classic example of inherent deficiency we'd like to get rid of. So part of our work has been to minimize or reduce totally, if we can, those sort of distortions that are inherent in the present system. Haven't the Japanese already leapfrogged your research and, are, and they're on their way to a dramatic single world standard? No, the Japanese have been working primarily on the program making standard. The IBA has been concentrating its efforts, along with other European broadcasters, on a transmission standard. And they are quite separate. You have a program making standard for the studios, a transmission satellite to get it from the studios to the people's homes. We work on the premise that we're going to be transmitting the signal to existing receivers in the main. You know, those existing receivers expect so many lines in each picture and so many pictures per second. That is the basis of our television system. 625 lines, 25 complete pictures a second. The Japanese one has a much higher number of lines, 1,125, and 30 pictures per second. And if you adopted the Japanese proposal, you would have to convert not only the number of lines in each picture to get to the sun, but the number of pictures per second. And both of those processes put in unnecessary forms of uh, built-in permanent impairment in the process. So, at the Dubrovnik meeting, there is certain to be European resistance to the single world standard favoured by the Japanese and Americans. The Europeans share the same goal, improved pictures, but they want to take it step by step. Research by the BBC has thrown up yet another approach to the problem. At Kingswood Warren, in the tranquility of Surrey's Greenbelt, croquet lawns are overshadowed by a satellite dish. Engineers here are working on a system which could benefit both Europe and Japan's favoured options. The BBC's uh, work on high definition uses a source which has 1250 lines and uh, has twice the resolution along the line. And um, most uh, future high definition systems will use something like that with a wider aspect um, ratio. And this gives you four times the definition of the present 625 line system. Now, it's very difficult to show the improvement that you get in a program that's going out in conventional television. But if, as it were, we put part of this high definition under microscope by coming very close in, then you can see the sort of detail that we get here compared with the detail that you get in this one here, where you don't have the sort of detail in the ships and the portholes that you have in this one, where you can see the portholes and so on. The problem is that this picture needs about four times the bandwidth to transmit as this one. And the channels are not likely to be available for that sort of thing. So you've got to compress it in some form. Now, digital techniques would be the best way of compressing it. And although we can send sound in digital form, it is not yet possible to send television in digital form. But the BBC's approach is to split this picture up into the parts that really are best sent digitally and add those to the analog um, conventional uh, picture uh, that is sent. And by adding those two together, you can get a substantial improvement in the uh, bandwidth compression over the original. In fact, BBC engineers believe that by using this process, which we've called digitally assisted television, DATV, we can 
get a picture of this sort into the sort of bandwidth that is at the moment required for transmitting one of these and get very close to the original picture. Could you give me an example of how DATV could improve picture quality in future? Yes. The thing that eats up the bandwidth is trying to get detail in things that are moving. If I freeze this picture here, you can see that a lot of the detail is lost. That is what you would get without using the DATV. But if you send to the receiver information in this digital channel about the nature of the movement of that in the original, there we are. And now you can see the detail has been recovered and we're pretty well back to, to the original. How important is it to get a single world standard for high definition television? Well, the BBC supports the move towards a single worldwide standard for studio production. And it is not opposed to the standard which has been put forward at TCI as a potential worldwide standard. But the BBC is conscious of the fact that any worldwide studio standard has to fit in with the rest of the television environments, which are different in the, the different parts of the world. So if, as part of the discussions and the studies, a standard which is more universally acceptable emerges, then the BBC, of course, will be very interested. Unfortunately, BBC policy on next month's meeting isn't nearly as clear as their digitally assisted pictures. However, the odds are that the world will probably be unable to agree on a single world standard now. Despite this, better pictures in some form or another are likely by the early 1990s, boosted by a new generation of satellites. The bad news is, just as the BBC asked for more money for a colour licence, so they'll ask for an increase again when the high definition service arrives. Oh, Ma Michael, that's not very good news, is it? Are we going to, is that what's going to happen? Well, I don't know about the financial implications for the viewers in the, at the end of the day, but all I do know is I've seen a lot of demonstrations of high-definition television, uh, and it is the most breathtaking uh, revelation. It's the difference between uh, a 78 record and digital compact disc, I mean, the, and it's the difference between black and white and colour. You don't realise how poor the definition is on the pictures that people are looking at now compared to what they would see on high-definition television. It is dazzling. When does BBC television hope to get it? Well, as soon as everyone can agree, as soon as the engineers can sort out uh, with manufacturers and, and so on what, what the line standards are going to be and which system is going to be used, because the engineers what? are all competing with each other, inventing different bits of gubbins. What's uh, your guess? Well, I hope sooner rather than later. I hope, I hope, I hope uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and I think once, once the consumer, the viewer, has seen high definition, you cannot look uh, at what you're looking at now. It's really very, very substandard. What do you feel about it, Cathy? I mean, I agree. I've seen it once. It was wonderful. But I just hope it doesn't end up like the Victorian railway system with none of the bits of the technology fitting in each other. I think we'll have to sort of develop all together, for which Matt. I like. I'm waiting for the big wall screen. I think what would be really lovely is when well, I can actually watch films at home like they are in the cinema, and I'm more impatient for that. Than, Mike, when do you think we're going to get that? Oh, well, that once the high definition is in, you can blow a picture up much, much bigger than you can a 625, ordinary 625 line picture, and you'll get terrific clarity. Uh, and that will come with, you'll be able to have that when the high definition comes in. All right, well, Max Hastings, Kathy Myers, Michael Gray, thank you all very much. In our next program, in a fortnight's time, Rory Bremner will be finding out what makes people good on chat shows. And we'll be reviewing Once a Thief on ITV on Sunday the 27th, 11.30 in the morning. Zastrozzi, the same evening on Channel 4 at 9 o'clock. And the German epic Heimat, which is shown every evening for 11 days on BBC Two, starting tomorrow at 9.40. And my guests then will be film director Lindsay Anderson, broadcaster David Jessel, and writer and critic Claire Tomlin. Finally, Clive James's recent coverage of a Japanese game show which cheerfully humiliates its participants came in for some criticism on Channel 4's right to reply. A reverend gentleman from Sunderland appeared in the video box to express his disgust at the sequence of one contestant being sick after eating grilled centipede and braised viper in a bathtub awash with toads. And no wonder. Good night. Well, I was hoping to be cheered up last weekend when I got back from church and I was sitting writing my sermon and Clive James on television came on. But oh dear, what a terrible letdown it was. If I want to watch people being sick and being interviewed as they are being sick, then I certainly don't want to watch it on a Saturday night as I'm getting ready for Sunday. It was quite revolting and I really think it was totally unnecessary
to show so much of that dreadful Japanese program showing people being tortured. Well, that's enough for me. Time for lunch now. Excuse me, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> In 50 minutes here on 2, tonight's Globe Theatre is Boy of the Muddy Shore. Set in the 50s, it's a moving story of a boy and his grandmother seeking refuge and a new life in a small fishing village in war-torn Korea. First on BBC Two, tonight's Newsnight. <laughs>